Uh, hello, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nadia and I'm the Head of Content and Growth Strategy at Linworks. And welcome to the session on strategies to optimize your e-commerce presence to drive growth. Um, I'd like to introduce our uh, session panelists for today. Um, Greg Gilman, who is the Chief Revenue Officer at Meet6. Blake Kidd, who is Director of Search and Marketplaces at Rise Interactive. Um, and Calvin Green, who is the Account Director at QueryClick. Uh, so I want to, I'll, we'll get straight into the panel discussion. So I just wanted to kick off by asking each of you to really just give a brief overview of your business and, and how you've worked with e-commerce and retail clients, um, particularly in, in the last year, what's, what's been the real area of focus? Um, so I'll, I'll pass over to Greg from Mute6 first. Good morning, thanks for having us. So uh, Mute6, we work with primarily D2C e-commerce companies and the past year and a half, it's definitely been interesting for us. You know, I think when COVID kind of first uh, started, there was a big pullback both on spend and, you know, obviously everyone was in, in panic mode and we saw kind of this dip in uh, March and April of uh, the year before. And then quickly after that, we saw both retailers, uh, brick and mortar retailers and our e-commerce businesses quickly pushing pretty heavily um, into the space to make up both for lost time and also um, CPMs were super low at the time, very low. So it was a lot you know, easier to buy um, traffic and we leaned in pretty heavily and we've kind of seen this ramp kind of level back out where CPMs are now back to the usual more expensive uh, than ever. Um, but you know, we can talk a little bit later about some of our strategy and how we leverage both content and the media buying to combat that. Uh, great, thanks. And and Blake, have have you seen similar? Yeah, yeah, definitely have. Well, uh, just as a, a brief intro for me, um, good to meet everyone. I'm Blake Kidd, um, working at Rise Interactive. We are um, a full service agency, so we manage you know um, every conceivable media channel, creative, customer experience, that sort of thing. But my personal um, specialization has been in search and marketplaces. And to mirror some of what what Greg was mentioning earlier, we did see um, you know some some significant challenges over the past year. Um, but like he he also alluded to, we did see a lot of advertisers pull back at the early part and mid part of 2020. Uh, and that's when we also leaned in a little bit more heavily. You know, cost per clicks were much cheaper then, um, and we were really able to lean in and be a little bit perhaps more aggressive than others were uh, early on in the pandemic. Um, that said, a lot of our advertisers' goals have really, um, you know, been aggressive in 2021, and we've had to be a little bit more creative in terms of how do we how do we ramp up, how do we find you know the next new audience, how do we engage the next you know marginal customer um, to engage and and um, you know kind of meet some of those. Uh, elevated goals. So yeah, happy to get into some of those um, more detailed strategies, uh, you know, as we keep talking. Uh, great, thanks. And and Calvin, at um, QueryClick, how, how, what, what has been, um, how have you been working with your clients? Yeah, hi. Um, so similar to, you know, what the guys just said, it's been, it's been a challenging time. I think the biggest, the biggest thing that I would say is, you know, the, the lockdown, the the COVID, everything that happened, we had to be flexible. You know, I think all 12 mob strategies were out the window. Um, so I think we've learned a lot over the last 12 years, I, oh, 12 months, sorry, that I think we're going to kind of adapt moving forward. So I think it's kind of changed the way we approach things a lot. Um, but at QueryClick as well, obviously we're similar to Blake, we're a full service agency, but we also have a software side. Um, so we have an attribution um, service that, um, obviously, we work closely with our clients, especially from the the, uh, the retail point of view. You know, this attribution side works alongside our services side, so we can really make sure that we're driving efficiencies with, with budget, spending in the right places when money is tight and every penny counts. Um, so I think that's been the biggest part of the last 12 months, definitely. Great. Um, yeah, and as mentioned, the growth numbers across e-commerce for the past 12 months have been sort of beyond all forecasts in terms of growth and revenue in in, in uh, many different verticals. Um, so, so has it, has this sort of been experienced with your clients, and and have you seen this growth spread evenly, or is there some some verticals in in retail that you've seen sort of outperform, or even even surprisingly in other in other verticals? Um, I'll, I'll stick with you, Calvin. Yeah, I mean it's been it's been a real mixed bag. I think um, at QueryClick we've got 
um, a range of different client, different retail clients. Um, we've got some within the B2B sector who are traditionally more trade focused um, and have like a, um, a physical store. So it's the, the last 12 months have been really positive for them because everyone's been forced to move online. Um, the challenge now is keeping them online and make sure that we've given them that experience so they don't need to go back in store. Um, but then we've got other clients who are more kind of occasion wear focused or, um, you know, fashion focused that where that wasn't the priority, people couldn't go out. Um, so we had to try and change tactics. You know, we've got one client who whose focus really is on kind of like dresses um, and where we've been locked down all summer. No one, you know, no one wanted, was buying dresses. So they had to buy, we had to move out, change our tactic to focus more on a new um, area for the business. So thinking more about casual wear, lounge wear. Um, so that was obviously an interesting challenge, but, um, you know, we're starting to come at the other end, the other side of that, but they've also now got a, a new factor for their new side of their business that they can focus on. Um, and then also we've got like, think about global clients. I think that's been the challenge and, and luxury clients, um, having to manage kind of different restrictions throughout, you know, obviously our restrictions over in the UK were different to the ones in America or different in APAC. Um, so obviously certain clients who focus, um, you know, on different times of the year and, and are like. One of our clients, for example, is a real um, focuses on kind of winter wear. Um, so we obviously have to manage that anyway, but also managing the fact that um, the lockdowns happened in different places. So it's been a real mixed bag. I think, um, you know, some good and, and some more challenging. Thanks, Calvin. And, and Blake, what, what's been your experience with your clients? Um, you know, have you, have you had sort of similar experience having a, a mixed bag or, or have you seen real growth or real, real struggle? You know, on my end, to your point, um, we've seen really great growth across pretty much all of our clients. I'll say it's been more evenly spread than I anticipated. We definitely have had the odd client that has, you know, their service has just really uh, been in the sweet spot for, you know, um, pandemic and lockdown life. I'm thinking in particular of a client we have that is, um, you know, home baking supplies. And, you know, as you might, um, as you might believe, a lot more people have been home baking, you know, in the last two years than have been previously. So they've done, you know, miraculously well. But, um, you know, aside from them, you know, we have seen good growth across essentially all of our clients. The, the one thing I will also say is on the U.S. side, um, there was a lot of, um, you know, uh, expectation. There was a lot of maybe anxiety about some of the stimulus checks that were coming down, you know, late last year, earlier this year. And were people going to take those and actually engage in e-commerce? Were they going to save them? Um, and we had several clients that are, you know, home goods, kind of at a lar larger price tag. I'm thinking of a client we have that um, is, a, is a mattress uh, manufacturer. Um, and there was this idea that people would take those stimulus checks, and, you know, go, you know, kind of invest in some of those high, higher ticket items. You know, we did see some of that uh, in April and, um, and March. Uh, when those stimulus checks came down. But on the whole, uh, you know, from my experience, that was not as big of a boost as I think a lot of people anticipated. So, um, you know, that also kind of illustrating the growth has been more even than uh, I think even I expected kind of going into going into this year. Okay, great. And and Greg, what what has been your experience, your sort of your client base? What have they, what, what's been their either growth or, or, or challenges? Yeah, so it's pretty interesting. We have a, a data team. Um, so we're also just a no, we're also an agency, uh, full service agency focuses, as I mentioned, mainly on D2C e commerce. We have a dashboard. I'm happy to share that even after that. We pull of our, all of our data. You know, we have 400 plus clients. We pull all of the data from the media buying by vertical. Um, and then built a dashboard that we can share, but it's it's pretty interesting. So we started publishing it right when COVID hit because we wanted a way to share with our advertisers who were in panic mode to say, look, here's what we're seeing on the ad buy side and by vertical. And you could see pretty quickly things like supplements, home fitness, even beauty and skincare took off in COVID because people weren't going to the spa, people weren't going to the gym. They still had the disposable income. It wasn't the end of the world yet. So it kind of like, leaned in and as we've come through like normally normally summer months for us i kind of joke that the j months for e-commerce are slow right july uh june july and january the summer months because people are traveling january because uh there's all the q4 fatigue but for the first year we've actually seen pretty consistent growth through the summer spend hasn't dipped um you know i think that there's a lot going on right now that contributes so covid iOS 14, iOS 15, people trying to get ahead of it. Um, 
And, you know, in terms of verticals, it's pretty even spread. I think, you know, uh, some of the other panelists mentioned home goods, um, things that kind of popped up, cookware, more people cooking at home, all of these things have seen like a pop. But traditionally, we work with like a lot of fashion and apparel brands. So I've seen kind of stale growth. I think over the summer, I've seen some flat growth in the beauty and skincare space, where sometimes we like to see it pushing a little higher. But those are verticals that I've seen it kind of flatten out where we'd like to see more, but everyone's just kind of gearing up for Q4 at this point. So spent, even if it's a little less profitable, we're still pushing hard and prospecting new audiences. So come Q4, when we put offers in front of people, um, we make sure that they buy. Yeah, great, great. And um, so there's, so off the back of the pandemic, because there's now this huge pool of e-commerce customers shopping with intent, you know, people who maybe didn't necessarily shop online before, they've discovered how convenient it is. Um, even, you know, they're even shopping for basics. So where should retailers be focusing their time, attention and budget? Um, so Greg, what are, what are some tips for retailers optimizing their marketing channel strategy and, and, and optimizing their ad spend across across these channels? So there's two types of so there's two types of companies that that I usually engage with. There's the D2C e-commerce companies where traditionally we're running if they're a true D2C e-commerce don't really sell a ton on Amazon but they just sell on their site, usually I'm recommending um, for the types of companies we work with. So we we have an 80 person in-house video creative team so we're really good at building content. And because we're good at building content, we're good at using Facebook and Instagram and uh, as a discovery platform. So traditionally I'm saying, let's run a blend of 70% Facebook, Instagram, 30% uh, Google and YouTube. And then once, a, let's say a brand is bigger, then we'll do 60% Facebook, 30% Google, and then 10% display. So that's for a D to C brand that sells their product um, only on their site. But if they're a brick and mortar retailer that also sells e-commerce product, that sells an Amazon, that sells to wholesalers, the mix is a little bit different, right? It's going to skew heavier naturally towards Google because it's a lot more intent data. People are in the stores. They, they come to the brand. They do the search. So there's strategies that we've been running to help those brands push harder into e-commerce because for the you know for many years we've been telling companies how important e-commerce is, and I think some of them didn't know how to pivot or don't have people in place who know how to pivot. So it's it's pretty interesting when you're having conversations with a company, you know, these massive uh, retail companies that don't have infrastructure that knows how to put it. Me telling them that e-commerce is important doesn't really, it doesn't resonate because like they don't have the infrastructure. They don't have someone on their side that's like puts up their hand and says, you know what, he's right. Let's build a strategy. But I think COVID is like really rung the alarm for these brands because when your revenue goes to almost zero for months on end, and then we kind of come back into the picture and we're like, look, e-commerce, we talked about how it's important. We've been in a year at losses, like how do we focus? So then we will build strategies to help those brands. But usually the, those larger brands, I've seen larger Google budgets um, just because they have a ton of search um, and shopping that they're already running and we help optimize. So it's less uh, Facebook there. But those are usually the distributions that uh, at least with Mute6, like how we would approach the accounts. Sight unseen. Okay, that, that's, that, that's that's really helpful, really interesting. And and, and Calvin, how um, uh, how should retailers determine their marketing investment between you know SEO and org organic and, and PPC? How how can they sort of strike the balance and and have the complementary strategies? Yeah, I think um, it's important here to be thinking more about the customers rather than the channel. Um, so if you're kind of creating those silos of your budget. You know, you're creating silos of your optimizations and your strategy. Um, so I like to think of it as like a, a whole search budget. Um, like I said, move away from thinking about channels and think how can I best serve my customers? How can I get in front of them as many times as possible? Um, I think what we see that works really well is the clients that do that, you know, that think about, you know, their paid efforts and their SEO efforts as one. Well. Um, you know, the ones that are willing to test. Um, for example, we as part of our attribution solution, we've got a... Um, tool that's called unified search that looks at the you know where you're potentially wasting spend um that your your visibility is is really strong for and then it's talking about reinvesting that spend into you know other in other channels or other areas of you know on pbc or paid social um you know thinking about those those companies that are willing to test on brand and saying okay maybe i don't need to spend here but i understand the benefits of bidding on brand 
Um, so I think it's really important to be willing to test, be really willing to be flexible. Um, you know, and it's also you need to understand what the priorities are for the business. Um, if you want to get something done really quickly and you want instant results, then obviously PBC is going to be able to, to support you in that. But if you're thinking more long term, um, you need to have that SEO foundations there and then you can start creating content. Um, I also think if you think about it as a search, as just one search marketing budget, you know, content is, is so important. You can use that across multiple channels. So it's not just uh, you create content that sits on the blog, you know, and that's it and let it, let it do its job. You know, you've got that content there that you can push on Facebook, push, push through other like social channels. Um, you know, you can create assets that you can use in other channels as well. So um, I, like, I think, yeah, it's best that when you have clients that are really willing to test, be flexible, um, and you're not just be like, here's my X amount for SEO, here's my X amount for PPC, but have it as one big search budget. Great, yeah, yeah, that that definitely makes sense. Um, that kind of flexibility for sure. Um, and Blake, how can retailers optimize their presence online to to differentiate their brand? Um, you know, while optimizing the spend in such a competitive retail environment, environment, particularly in in some categories. Yeah, it's a great question. I think, for me, the key, uh, one of the keys to optimizing across channels is going to be um, this idea of of incrementality. It's something that We've been thinking a lot about um, at Rise for a number of years, and our clients are starting to ask us a lot more about the idea of incrementality being, you know, how do we make sure that our paid dollars are driving sales that we would not have otherwise gotten through our just kind of baseline organic results? And this ties in very heavily to what Calvin was just mentioning, right? It has to be a constant test and learn framework to say, you know, hey, did, did my spend on branded terms actually drive incremental, you know, um, um, revenue, or was it just revenue I would have otherwise gotten? Um, you have to spread that not just across, you know, paid and organic, although I think that that's one of the biggest, um, you know, kind of hallmarks of that analysis, but especially into the marketplaces space as well. Um, there's a lot of, of incrementality analysis to be done. I think the most important idea about this is um, if you are interested in incrementality and kind of what that means for your spin and your brand, the major platforms do not have much to say about that, right? They do not offer, Google does not offer a great set of tools, or Amazon does not offer a great set of tools to address incrementality discussions. You know, they've been largely mute on that idea, um, you know, pretty much for the past, you know, five years. So if you want to address those questions, you need an agency partner to kind of do some custom modeling for you. Uh, and so, the, you know, that's what we do. And, and I'm sure I can uh, say the same for Greg and, and Calvin. Um, but, you know, there's a million ways to go at, at that question. I think. Uh, you know, thinking about the paid versus organic um, interplay is probably the most important way. And so when you think about, um, you know, on a product level, um, you can go marketplace by marketplace, you know, to stick with like an Amazon versus Walmart analogy, you might look at Amazon and say, you know, hey, our paid, our paid spend is very efficient here. We, we're getting a great return on uh, ad spend, but organic is doing great by itself, right? Maybe we don't actually need the paid spend to drive good performance here. Um, and on Walmart, we can see the opposite is true. So we actually need to you know, shift our dollars from Amazon to Walmart to basically support where the most incremental performance is happening. And doing that across all of your marketplaces, across all of your platforms, across all of your channels is how you find that really good, intelligent mix that is driving the most value for your brand. Great. And, and it was interesting you mentioned marketplaces because I wanted to talk specifically about them. Um, so they've outperformed all other e-commerce channels over the last year. Um, and do, so do retailers have to have a marketplace presence to be to be truly competitive and to be found? You know, how can retailers manage performance across these multiple sales channels? So, um, so Blake, for retailers who are leveraging marketplaces and and these channels uh, where they lose some control over the relationship with the customer and, and perhaps some some data and insights what what information can they leverage to improve performance and 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 build that customer relationship or, or find more customers or or remain competitive yeah that, that's a great question you know, to to the overall question of do mark do advertisers need to have a marketplace presence to be successful you know, i'd say the short answer is yes you know i'm, I'm very much in favor of um, continuing to grow marketplaces one of the trends that we've seen over the past year is that while um, e-commerce has done very well over the past year, it has also gotten more expensive, especially in the cost per click arena. Um, you know, people uh, are new advertisers are crowding into the space as they, you know, start to expand their their online presence, maybe even for the first time, as, as Greg mentioned earlier, uh, and that is causing cost per clicks everywhere to rise. 
but they are rising, in my experience, more slowly on the marketplaces side, where there's just overall a little bit less competition, especially in some of the newer marketplaces. Um, so that I think is an essential part to to any kind of advertisers, um, you know, uh, marketing, um, uh, you know, kind of diet, if you will. Um, in terms of you know what information can you actually leverage on marketplaces, you know, I'll push back slightly on the idea that you lose too much control. It's definitely not, you know, your own website. It is you're hosting on, you know, to use Amazon's example, Amazon's PDPs. Um, but through, you know, kind of A plus content and those sorts of things, you actually can really leave a your branded kind of stamp on a PDP, building out, you know, your own storefronts. You can definitely have good customer moments um, with your brand, even on something that's kind of like, you know, sterile like an Amazon PDP. So there there is uh, you know stuff that you can do in that respect. Um, but ultimately the biggest metrics you're going to come down to is, you know, still looking at click-through rates, still looking at conversion rates, and, uh, you know, even doing organic analyses, looking at click shares. So, um, you know, if you're looking at, you know, for example, the top five, you know, organic products um, for a given search on Amazon, you can see Amazon will, will show you reports for, you know, your product may have appeared higher on the page, but it's owning a lower click share than the other products. So maybe you need to change your, um, you know, thumbnail image to be, uh, more like those other brands, or maybe you need to, uh, you know, address your title to be more descriptive than the other brands. Those analyses are always, um, you know, I, I think the most helpful. And then lastly, I would say looking at um, brand halo reports as well, uh, or product halo reports to say, hey, you know, people clicked through this particular product, but they actually purchased a different product. That is, uh, you know, reporting that most marketplaces make available to you. And that I think is tremendously valuable to understand kind of the consumer thought process. You know, are there key moments to upsell uh, a, a consumer to, you know, another product? Are they actually just uninterested in the original product that they were drawn into? Maybe that there's something in the spend mix that you can address there. So that kind of that halo reporting I also, also find extremely, um, extremely uh, critical. Thanks, thanks, Mike. Um, and Greg, keen to get your thoughts on marketplaces. Um, what what are sort of one learnings from from this from marketplaces or one of the sales channels that that um, retailers can utilize to expand into into multi channel selling, or how how can they leverage this information? Yeah, I think it, it's pretty interesting. So, and I think Blake talks about it. And uh, you know, one of the main things that you need to solve for, my opinion, first is like the attribution, because like. So again, the types of companies that we at least work with are more, they all want to sell traditionally more on their D2C than marketplaces. I usually find that they will sell on their own site and then kind of level up into marketplaces. I think the key, if you still want to scale uh, Facebook and Google um, on marketplaces is to potentially leverage products like don't put every product on the marketplace because the problem is if again if you think about let's say if you put everything that uh you have on amazon and you also sell on your d2c i get this a lot i have a lot of amazon businesses that reach out you know and they're like look amazon is great revenue but i lose control i lose pieces of the data we want to be spending more on facebook but the problem is as a consumer if you think about it if i see an ad on facebook and i click the product and i go to it First two things I usually do, one, I go to Google to see if it's legit or if there's a discount. Second, I go to Amazon to see if it's on Prime. If I see it's on Prime, I click, I buy, and that's it. So while advertisers will gain the uh, revenue from it, you lose some of the attribution there and it becomes more challenging to scale, at least on the Facebook side. And there's definitely tools in place that you can leverage. Um, but my, my thought with marketplaces is don't put your entire catalog there. Pick things that are going to be attractive that you will be able to lure people back into your site so they can buy more product. Because ultimately, it's not just about selling product. It's about first party data, right? And as we move farther and farther into um, a lot of these iOS updates, and it's always been we've talked about first party data being the most important. I think that is even more valuable and doing more like LTV thought around how do we make sure that not only we get the purchase, but we get the customer. And then how do we, you know, kind of and the, the best way to do that ultimately is to bring them back into your funnel. So I always like to say marketplaces are good for some large brands that are already on it, so they don't have a choice. And there's a couple other strategies you can use. But from the Mute 6 perspective, it's how do we bring them back through so they can purchase on our site potentially um, and we can capture that data and use that data again. 
Yeah, great, great insight there. And Calvin, um, Amazon is now capturing a huge amount of search volumes. Uh, you know, even people are starting to search on Amazon. So how can retailers optimize their presence, whether it's on marketplaces, Amazon and, and any other one, or, or just generally with their products to ensure they're visible to these, these consumers who, who have that kind of shopping intent? Yeah, I mean, Amazon is always going to be, you know, a, a challenge on price. You know, that's part of why they're so so popular, right? So, you know, retailers need to be thinking of it as part of their strategy rather than as a competitor. Um, one thing to do is to make sure the price isn't the most important. You know, is there one client of ours who has this you know, direct problem, you know, wants to focus on loyalty and customer exp um, and like different offers for customers? Um, you know, think about sustainability and other things that may appeal to customers to kind of say, you know, buy through us, buy through the brand directly. Um, or you can obviously utilize um, Amazon itself. So, you know, you can diversify your paid channel mix, you know, make sure you're utilizing those ads on Amazon. Um, if Amazon isn't your main point of sale, you know, the best way to optimize is um, for exposure and visibility is with a healthy product feed, um, using tools like feed management to optimize titles and descriptions and product data. You know, we'll make sure that we're kind of seen by users um, with intent across the channels. Um, and there's also the part around thinking about, you know, obviously Amazon captures a lot of the products, you know, when, when users are at that end of the buy-in journey. Um, so thinking about the kind of the old awareness stage of the journey, um, thinking about more longer tail keywords, um, thinking about creating content that we can obviously use to build up that brand, get in front of the client earlier in, the, in their buy-in journey. Um, it's still, uh, you know, it's a fundamental part of, SEO, but I think it has a, a really important part to play in this. Yep, definitely. And and beyond ad spend, what other areas should retailers be focusing on to create a, a strong brand presence and, and visibility and, and to improve conversion, customer loyalty and competitiveness? And um, so Calvin, what, what are the key areas of focus for building, say, a strong SEO presence to support performance? What would you say the kind of the key building blocks? I think from an SEO point of view, um, the fundamentals are still there. I mean, so currently I'm actually renovating a house and I like to think of it the same as SEO, that you need to get the kind of boring basics, the fundamentals um, there. So think about your tech side of things before you start doing anything flashy, um, before you, you know, the content's there, you need to have a strong base. Um, so, you know, focusing on that tech side of things, getting a real foundation before you start, you know, even thinking about other paid channels, et cetera. Um, is is key. Um, Google's obviously done a lot with the core web vitals piece and page speed over the last six months, 12 months. Um, so it's moving a, a lot more to the kind of user experience side of things. Um, so we need to be focusing on that page speed. Um, there's also the content I was talked about, you know, maximizing that content, creating it, you know, you've got assets there you can create that you can utilize on other channels to kind of see if that's efficiencies that clients can, can maximize. Um, and there's obviously still the offsite piece. You know, it's like been there for the backlinks piece has been there for, since I, at least I've been working in SEO. Um, you know, it's still a fundamental part of any SEO strategy. So you have to have a real holistic approach to kind of offsite, um, your content, your tech, you know, all the fundamentals are there, but also thinking about that user experience as well. Yep, definitely. And and Blake, what are, what are key areas of the customer experience that retailers should focus on to drive performance and increase customer value? How how can they sort of influence that customer experience through through these marketing channels? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think about um, two kind of key two kind of key areas, maybe two kind of key moments uh, in that customer experience. And again, I'll, I'll lean back on the marketplaces side because I think that that's it's pretty interesting and emerging there. Um, the first would be that first glance when someone searches for, you know, a product or a brand um, on Amazon, they have the good results page. Like, what's the first glance look like? And I bring that up because obviously, you know, people know through paid search and stuff like that, you can you can conquest other competitors if you so choose. On Amazon, that's really, um, you know, far spread that, you know, Amazon offers a million ways to conquest other competitors, um, whether you're appearing on their PDPs, whether you're appearing on their um, branded terms. And so... I really would encourage brands to be cautious about, um, you know, letting that get too far away from them, I guess, and, and letting competitors um, bid on their own terms too extensively. Um, I know that there's a lot of, and I, we spoke earlier about incrementality, so there's some push-pull here, but there are, you know, some, some trepidation about bidding on your own branded terms. If someone thinking, if someone has searched for your branded term, they're definitely going to find you no matter what. You know, I would encourage people to take a little bit um, 
uh, to rethink that attitude a little bit. Um, you know, there really can be a lot of competitive results that appear above your brand. And so I would encourage you to not be that afraid to bid on your own branded terms and to basically show competitor or show, show consumers that you know, you're willing to, you know, stick up for your, your own brand, if you will. Um, you know, think about bidding even on your own PDPs. I know that seems crazy in some areas, but crowding out competitors in that kind of aspect of the customer experience, I think is uh, and, and playing defense, if, if you will, on your own products is something I, I find uh, pretty important to influencing um, consumers. That's the first part. The second part would be your content. And, and uh, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of interesting success recently about content which links a product to um, a consumer's lived experience of that product. And what I mean by that is, you know, maybe I'll give one example. Um, so we have a customer, a, a client who's basically shipping kind of very large, very bulky home goods. And so some of the content we've had, seen success with is just, you know, kind of representing to customers, what does this product look like when it ships to my door, right? Like, what's the size of this package? Is it going to fit through my door? You know, like that that kind of mundane, maybe even prosaic, um, you know, question, you know, what does the packaging look like when I open it up? Is there going to be assembly required? You know, um, that, that sort of thing uh, is really valuable to basically, again, from an online experience only, where more and more people are starting their searches online, linking that product to you know, how it fits into their life, linking that product into like, what that purchase is and shipping is going to look like has been surprisingly effective on my end. So those are two areas that, yeah, I'd encourage brands to think about a little bit more. Excellent. Thanks, Blake. And, and content's a really interesting topic. Um, Greg, what, what role can content play in driving performance on-site and off-site? You mentioned earlier you, you also produce a lot of content for clients. And so, so what do you see as, as, as the role it can play? Yeah, so it's been a strong focus for us. We've been making video content for about four years. And I think one thing that we try and do is we build, we both shoot enterprise level content and we, we, um, we have a staff of about 40 editors that work directly with our media buyers that will slice and dice content for, you know, primarily for Facebook, Instagram. Uh, we do a lot with YouTube and then TikTok and Snapchat and kind of like cut content depending on what channel it is and then use it cross channel. So we've seen to Blake's point, like it's really good to put people in the spot of like the experience. We want them to know from the time that they click an ad till it shows up at their door, like what is it going to look like? So we have a couple different types of formats that we know work, you know, traditional like intro videos, which are like, you know, user value prop focus to unboxing to we make a lot of user generated content. These are kind of three levers that I think usually will pull the hardest. And then we have a variety of other content elsewhere. Um, but the goal is let's put the user in the experience as much as we can because every other brand is doing it. So in my opinion, brands that don't really push on content or don't have content resources are the ones that are falling behind. Um, you know, Facebook says that, you know, a, a campaign success is based off of mobile first content, uh, mo mobile first video creative, which is they say 60% of the game at this point. And anyone who's buying media can kind of attest to that. It's, you know, it's less and less on the strategy. You know, Facebook has implemented things like CBO, ABO, where like you can tell they're trying to take jabs and if Facebook had their way, they would probably potentially remove agencies and let brands just directly upload content, directly upload their feed, and they would mix and match, right? We see it with Google. Um, I think Facebook would like to do it, but I think at the end of the day, agencies are still figuring out how to better hack Facebook than Facebook can you know, optimize. So it's where we're agencies in general are still, I think, winning. But content first strategy is the name of the game. I think all brands want it. Um, and I think that the brands that are successful, the ones that we see that are spending, you know, low seven figures per month per channel are the ones that are investing heavily on creative strategy and not just creative that's meant to look good or feel good, but creative that's reverse engineered to sell product. Um, and the other piece of it is, I think, leveraging creative um, from channel to channel. So we do a lot of media buying on TikTok. And one thing that we found early on was TikTok is a tough, uh, is tough to make work, especially so the advertisers we work with are all performance based. So there's two types of buckets, I think, of brands that, that spend money on TikTok. One are large brands that have large budgets that don't care really how much it performs or just trying to buy, you know, cheaper impression share. And then there's performance brands, you know, D to C e-commerce that are, you know, ROAS focused that want to test the waters. So like 
on the second bucket of companies, you know, you have to have a strategy there that works. So there's TikTok influencers that you need to kind of partner with in order for that channel to work. So we do outreach, we negotiate with the TikTok influencers, we'll do the media buying, we can whitelist with them. There's a whole slew of things we can do there. But the second piece that we found is we were taking all that TikTok content and running it as ads on Instagram and Facebook and in stories. And that content was performing super well. And one thing that we found is the more native the content feels, the better. People don't like buying from ads. They, you know, content has to be relatable at this point. It's less aspirational and more relatable. So people sniff through aspirational, but they want relatable. So we focus on building what I call like relatable content. Excellent. Yeah, it's really, really great insights on how to use content. Um, and and finally, uh, sort of the last last question is: as we move into twenty twenty two, and and you know retailers and and high streets and and shopping malls um, emerge from the pandemic, what what do you see as kind of the key uh, issues or opportunities for retailers? So I guess uh, two two questions there: the key issues and challenges, particularly as physical retail um, returns, um, and then the opportunities, new new customer behaviors, new this huge new pool of new online online shoppers um, and, and these channels to capture these shoppers with intent. So Greg, uh, firstly to you, what, what, what do you see both the, the challenges and, and the opportunities? Yeah, so I think the challenges are, you know, you have again the, in the two subsets, uh, the brands that are still heavily focused in retail, you know, the ones that are at the malls at Bloomingdale's. And again, I'm gonna talk more on the, the apparel, but anyone who's selling to uh, places that are relying on foot traffic, you know, I know that they are all looking at D to C strategies. So I think it's how do you build one that encompasses both, um, that has both touch points. You know, these brands don't want to upset their wholesale or their retail partners, which, you know, I completely understand. I think, you know, the brands that I think I personally like that I think are doing it well, D to C brands that are going into storefronts. So we're here in Los Angeles and at the Century City Mall, you have, I mean, there's probably 10 brands that I know that have storefront in that mall. We have a couple um, of our clients that do it. And I was chatting with one of them recently and he's like, look, as long as I break even on that store, I don't care. It's a great touch point. It's, uh, you know, I have tons of people coming in, touching the product. Um, and, it's the, and it's the store that like, when people see it, he's like, they send me a photo. He's got one in New York, he's got one here in LA, but they send a photo and they're like, oh, I'm at your store. And he's like, it's a great way to continue to keep people engaged. He's like, so as long as I break even, I make enough to pay the rent, I don't care. I know that I'll make it up. You look at companies like Allbirds, Untucket, and, and all the brands that go D to C first, leverage into retail, I think are doing it right because people like shopping, right? I think that the, the and if you think about it as a consumer, it's always cool when you, you're shopping on, online and then you see the brand in person and you can go in because it shows me like they've made the leap. They're embracing the fact that people want to shop in person um, and leaning into that. So there's there's actually been some really cool concepts that I've seen um, out here in LA, companies that are trying to bridge the gap between like expensive leases for retailers, like and not wanting a long-term lease where like I was chatting with a company and they were considering doing a rev share model on, they will, they will cover the cost of the lease. If you wanna do a pop-up for a month and they'll do a rev share on the profit of all the stuff that's sold in stores. I've seen pop-ups here um, and I think that that is the way that if I'm a D to C brand, I focus is so many people forget about how important like a touch point is um, or building street teams or like getting product in the hands of people where you're not relying on prospecting into very expensive pools of traffic. You know, if I'm a if I'm a food and bev company, I've talked with many here in L.A. One thing I would consider is putting your product, putting a QR code on it getting out onto the street, Third Street, Promenade, Venice Beach, wherever your target market, and put that product in the hands of people. Take, you know, how much are you going to spend to pay a couple people to hit the street, talk with people, give them product? It's a lot more than it would cost you to prospect that pool of people just on Facebook in a day. So I think it's embracing a mix of both, leveraging that people do like to talk with people in person, that people do like to physically go in and touch. Um, and I think for retailers, it's how do I figure out a D to C um, play, focusing on, you know, making sure that they are competitive with the other brands, right? So it's shipping and return policies are what they need to make sure that they are lining up with both with Amazon um, and all the other retailers are out there. So it's usually free returns 
um, and making sure that they can get product in the hands of people um, quickly. And I think one of the biggest things that brand everyone needs to think about right now is as we roll into Q4, there's this massive backlog. Here in LA, there was an article, I think there's 70 cargo ships waiting to come in so they can offboard product um, to make sure. So I have a feeling that D to C, we're gonna have a heavy push. People should start shopping earlier, but you might even get these waves like where it's both, like let's say products tied up on ships, people are gonna go back into store because they wanna make sure that they can get gifts in time. So I think it's, it's having a balance, being prepared on both sides, but ultimately is a business wanting to decide which direction you can go and where you wanna focus. If it's D to C and it's first party data and it's revenue coming from those channels, there's a strategy there. If it's in person, which I haven't heard too many people saying we only want to do in person, but it's you know kind of that hybrid of both. Yeah, that that that's really interesting. Uh, well, it'd be really interesting to see how that how that pans out. Um, and Blake, what what what's your thoughts on on both the challenges and opportunities in coming going into the next year? Absolutely. Um, I think on the challenges end, I think a lot about inventory, especially inventory management. Um, and I, I say this again, coming from predominantly a marketplaces perspective, you know, maybe I can make a small uh, request of, of our listeners here, which is, you know, if you're a brand, please, please tie your agency into your inventory management conversations. You know, that is, it's so important, um, especially as you mentioned, Nadia, with physical retail coming back to some extent after a couple down years, you know, now you have even more um, kind of, uh, uh, you know, inflection points of how to manage that inventory um, and especially as even more marketplaces come online, you know, it gets relatively complicated to to send out that inventory and to manage your run rates. And so, you know, tying back to what I mentioned a little bit earlier um, in, in the panel about um, incrementality, you know, there is nothing less incremental than, um, you know, not realizing that you only, it, you, you are trying to make some uh, inventory last for three months and you uh, leverage ad spend and blow through that revenue, it, it, blow through that inventory in, in, in a week. You know, that is an extremely unincremental thing to do. Um, and I think that that's going to be a, a much bigger challenge as the places to you know, distribute inventory to get more complex in the coming years. So that's something that I, I would uh, view as, as a challenge. I know that there are um, plenty of good solutions. I think, you know, Linworks in particular actually has a great solution for kind of that inventory management uh, piece of it. So that that's on my mind. Uh, and then in terms of, you know, on the opportunity side, but also maybe a little bit of a challenge will be, um, you know, marshalling you know, effectively your data across so many more platforms and, and essentially, you know, not, making sure that you can manage your time effectively across all of these different platforms as well. You know, coming from the paid search or so, um, there's this been, there's been this big dichotomy between Google and Bing, right? And those are the two big players. And so there is so much, you know, um, um, thought around how do we make sure that our strategy across Google and Bing is consistent, but we're not just doubling everything we do. And there were a number of platforms that were, you know, created to address that. Um, that kind of same uh, paradigm is going to be, you know, magnified by tenfold in the marketplaces space in the coming years. Whereas, you know, that's not, not just, it's going to be two platforms. Money platform probably have to you know manage uh, advertising campaigns, inventory like I mentioned earlier, making sure your strategies are you know discreet enough to cater to those individual audiences, but also um, you know joined and comprehensive enough in some way that you're not just literally you know duplicating everything you do by 20x. Um, so you know agency partners again probably the best place to find those kind of solutions. You know most folks, including Rise, have you know software solutions that we can you know, marshal all of your data into one central component to make sure that you're uh, not kind of, you know, wasting any any time and making sure that your strategy is comprehensive across, you know, all of your various platforms. But that issue is only going to, uh, you know, increase in salience, in my opinion, over the next, you know, five years. Thanks, Blake. Um, and, and over to you, Calvin, for sort of the final word. What What's your thoughts on on the key, both the key uh, issues or challenges and, and, and what are the opportunities? Yeah, I mean, Blake and Greg, Greg have both made, you know, really good points. I think the biggest challenge for me is is the unknown. You know, people, we obviously like to forecast and plan in this industry, but it's become almost impossible. Um, we don't know what's going to happen with, with the pandemic. We don't know what's going to happen with lockdown, different restrictions. Um, so trying to plan and, you know, you kind of advise using historical data, um, you know, it's become a real challenge. I think if you were trying to forecast, you know, we, we've been doing forecasts looking at 2019 data, but 
you know, so much has changed in the world since then. Um, because obviously we don't want to look at 2020 data because there's so many factors outside of, you know, of marketing. So I think that has been a real challenge. I think thinking about UK specifically, obviously more similar to what uh, Greg said about stocking with um, stock challenges, you know, and supply and logistics, you know, the whole issue with Brexit, you know, we don't know if we're going to have the stock in for Christmas. We don't know if people are going to, you know, you know, we don't, we just don't know. Um, we don't understand, you know, what Christmas is going to be like. Obviously Black Friday over here has been a, a real revelation over the last six years since we stole it from America. Um, but, you know, is that going to be the, the new Christmas now? You know, are, are people going to spend, you know, obviously there's people still on furlough still without, um, without jobs. So, you know, are they, how are they going to spend? Are they going to be more cautious this year or have they saved money because of lockdown? Um, so that's a, that's a tricky one. I think it's a real opportunity to kind of take stock. Um, you know, like, like Blake just said there, there's loads of different channels we can, we can be looking at. Um, trying to put all that into one place um, and have one source of truth, you know, un sort out your data and make a real decision based on spend um, is, is a really good idea. I think that was where I'd be telling my, my client to focus, you know, get your data sorted, make sure you've got a real source of truth um, and really understand the impact of, of all your channels. So where you should be spending that money um, and where you should be driving efficiencies. Thank, thanks a lot. Um, and yeah, some some incredible insights there, and some lots of tips and and yeah, great insights and and um, and experience there. To to which brings us to the end of this panel. Um, I'd like to thank our speakers today: Greg Gilman, Chief Revenue Officer at Mute Six; Blake Kidd, Director of Search and Marketplaces at Rise Interactive; and Calvin Green, Account Director at Query Click. Um, it's been it's been hugely valuable. There's so much to digest from this panel, and, and if if uh, viewers want to watch it again or, or share with colleagues, it will be available on demand on the same link uh, directly after the end of this session. So, uh, uh, also like to um, uh, let you know that um, if you do have any Q and A, uh, which you've I've submitted during the panel. We will we will be answering those questions um, directly uh, and on our blog after the event. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today, and and we'll wrap it up there. But please take a look at the agenda for Lynn Academy and um, pick another session to join. Thank you very much.